the InfoWars Nightly News. It is Friday, June 6, 2014, and I'm Leanne McAdoo. Here's what's coming up tonight. Tonight, a snitching sheriff calls DHS on a record-requesting journalist. Then, a Michigan medical law mandates that doctors have private time with your children. And proof that the terrorists who hate us for our freedoms have nothing to hate anymore. Here's what you cannot take. You cannot take my camera. You cannot take. Nowadays, it's about hiring little social worker bureaucrats who are on power trips and want to dominate you. Well, a new law mandates that your children have to have a private conversation with a doctor before every visit. That's right. The doctor can talk to your kids about sex and all kinds of things without your knowledge and without your consent. You can't even opt out of it. Now, Michigan mother Christine Duffy brought her 17-year-old daughter into her physician's office just for a minor foot injury, and she was told that a new medical access law required a nurse to have a private conversation with her child. Now, the mom asked, how can I opt out? And the receptionist told her, there is no way to opt out. Now, obviously, the mom lost her cool, and then the office manager pulls her aside to explain what would happen in this private conversation. Now, Duffy explains that she said there was a new policy that would allow a child to access his or her medical records online, and then the child would be allowed to block a parent from viewing the website. Now, these are kids from 12 to 17 years old. So the nurse would also inform my children that the doctor's office is a safe place for them to receive information about STDs, HIV, and birth control. And that is what the nurse would be chatting about with my children without any pesky parental oversight. So obviously this case just highlights the fact that the government is now trying to supersede your parental authority and let children know that it's the state that are there to protect them and that are there to teach them and sometimes there to protect them from their own parents. Now, obviously, I can understand there are certain times when a child might like privacy, like maybe if they're undergoing child abuse, right? But a lot of times we have seen examples of children, you know, being alone with a doctor and asking what's happened, and the kid says, my, my dad spanked me, and then a full-on CPS investigation takes place. But the fact is, is the state is now trying to tell you that you cannot opt out of educating your own children about sexuality, about, you know, sexual prom promiscuity and, and, you know, telling them to abstain from sex, you know, prior to marriage. Whatever your views are, they're basically letting you know that they're the ones that are going to be educating your children about these things. Now, I know that a lot of parents get a little bit uncomfortable speaking to their kids about the birds and the bees, and so they just kind of let the schools do that. And now it's kind of the schools and the state thinks that is their job. And it's kind of gotten to the extreme because now parents have no idea what their children are being taught in schools. Now, parents of a middle school student in San Marcos, California, were upset about questions that their 14-year-old daughter was being asked during an apparent sex ed lesson. Now, in a family life and health class lesson purporting to teach appropriate dating behaviors for the middle school level, students were asked to disclose how far they'd gone sexually. Now, these were students at the Woodland Park Medical School, Middle School, pardon me, and they were asked to stand beneath signs. The signs were labeled smiled at, hugged, kissed, above the waist, below the waist, and all the way. These are middle school children. Now, one, one student told her parents that she was really embarrassed and disturbed, and she felt peer pressured. And obviously, that's quite embarrassing to ask these children, you know, dis disclose how far they've gone by standing under a sign. Now, she and her classmates were in disbelief because they thought it was actually their teacher who wanted to know how far they've gone sexually. Now, obviously... You know, we don't need to get into how disturbing that thought could possibly be because with all of the teachers engaging in pedophilia lately and also teachers having sex with their students. But Adon Salazar wrote an article a couple of weeks ago about a former abortion counselor who admitted that the, their programs sexualize kids at a young age in order to keep the business flowing in. Because as we've reported, abortion is a huge cash cow. And... You know, that's coming from a person who is a former abortion counselor. Now, obviously, school is the ultimate indoctrination station. So if you have no idea what your kids are being taught at school, you know, there's no telling how confused 
they're going to be. There's all kinds of confusing messages out there from the television um, and movies. And now, you know, you really have no control about what your kids are being taught in the classroom if you're not aware. Now, speaking about confusion, just ask the parents of uh, this, the boy in this next story. They're trying to teach their kid, you know, about honesty and telling the truth and owning up when you do something wrong. And then the school punishes him for being honest. Um, this was a seven-year-old, another child. He was suspended for accidentally bringing a toy gun to school. It was a plastic gun. And he had brought a backpack to school that he doesn't normally bring with him. And he found the gun in one of the front pockets in the backpack. And he admitted to bringing it. He, he grabbed it and took it up to the teacher and said, I didn't know I had this. I'm not allowed to have this. And he gave it to her. Well, instead of dealing with the incident in a rational way, the teacher followed protocol by escalating the case to the principal, who in turn escalated it to the superintendent for review. Now, the boy was suspended until a decision on his punishment was made. Now, the mother was so angry, she sent him back to school the next day, and they gave him in-school suspension, you know, until they could resolve this thing, until the father would come pick him up. But she's, she's asking, what kind of message are we sending to our kids to tell the truth and then you get in trouble for telling the truth and you get punished for it? So basically you're teaching him to just hide it and keep it in his bag so he doesn't get in trouble. And that's basically the confusion that these schools are teaching. But obviously this zero tolerance policy for guns in school has gotten so out of hand that now lawmakers are actually having to push legislation that uh, says simulating a firearm is not grounds for disciplinary action. Now, the language in the bill actually says brandishing a partially consumed pastry or other food item as something shouldn't, that should not land students in hot water. Now, that's, of, co of course, referring to the case of the young boy who bit his Pop-Tart into the shape of a gun. And the teachers freaked out about it, and they suspended him. And now there's actually legislation that spells it out for all of these people who are just following protocol that that's really not that big of a deal. It is absolutely ridiculous. But it is not just your children who are being indoctrinated into intimidation. It is also journalists and citizen journalists, freedom of the press, constantly under attack, photography, constantly under attack. This next case, of course, takes it even further. Now they're going full on intimidation tactics. A sheriff in Tennessee called Homeland Security on a reporter. He, a journalist, he was attempting to obtain public records about the treatment of prisoners at a local jail. Now, Alex Friedman is the editor for the Prison Legal News, and he's been working on a piece about complaints that are coming out of the Marshall County Jail. Now, he's now suing Sheriff Normal Dalton for refusing to release those public records of alleged questionable practices in the prison system. Now, Friedman says that after Sheriff Dalton refused to provide him with records pertaining to medical care and other services for inmates, he paid him a home visit. He then ordered background checks on him, and then he even called the Department of Homeland Security in an effort to get the federal agents to harass Friedman. So in this case, the reporter was trying to find out if the inmates were only being fed twice a day. And if that was the case, then that could mean that the sheriff's department was actually financially profiting off of that skipped meal. So here we have an investigative journalist. He's trying to, you know, find out if there's any official misconduct going on. And the Department of Homeland Security is called in to harass this man. They are now being leveraged as a tool of intimidation against any American or any journalist who would dare question the government and their goings on. And here we have the law enforcement, you know, sit, calling up their buddies at Homeland Security to say, hey guys, I need you to pay this journalist a visit. Um, and these are public records, okay? This man didn't even file a FOIA, re a FOIA act. He's just, um, you know, walked into the jail to request these public records. So in Texas, we have a photojournalist who was told that photography is suspicious in a post 9-11 America. That's right, this is the new rhetoric that the cops just kind of make up whatever laws they want to. Uh, this was a, a video uploaded to YouTube this week and it shows a photographer in Pampa, Texas being detained for suspicious activity. He was legally filming a police stop from a public sidewalk. Now shortly after this traffic stop came to an end, the photographer is approached by a deputy Stokes 
who immediately attempts to confiscate all photography equipment for evidence. The cop comes up to him and says, I'm going to need all that. I'm going to need all that equipment for evidence. Now, this this um, photographer knew his rights, of course. And so he's asking the cop, you know, by what right do you have to confiscate my equipment? And the cop can't provide the law that allows for confiscation. And then so he gets the officer gets really upset. He grabs the photographer's camera and says, your filming is a violation and you can't go around just filming us, which is, of course, false because the Supreme Court has upheld repeatedly the right to film a police officer in public. And then, of course, the mood changes when the photographer turns it around on the sheriff and says that he's going to sue him for assault. Don't point the camera at my face. Yes, sir, you're a public officer, correct? I'll point it down if you like. Thank you. Okay. My concern is this is not the first traffic stop that you photographed tonight? Correct. It's not the first one that you videotaped okay. tonight? You're refusing to tell me where you're from? Okay. And post 9-11, that concerns me. Okay. Okay? Yep. Your That's video, fair. Your video and your photographing all of the county buildings? Okay. And you refuse to cooperate with an investigation? So basically the cop is using the old post 9-11 terrorist activity. I don't know if that camera is a gun, you know, that whole rhetoric. But the entire time he's basically trying to spin lies to this photographer because if the man didn't know his rights, then the cop, that's what their job is, is to lure you into self-incrimination. And that's what this cop was repeatedly trying to do. The video is up there on InfoWars. He's just making up these arbitrary laws at one point. The man, uh, the photographer says, I have the right to not answer those questions. And he says, well, you only have the right to remain silent after you're arrested. False. That is not true. That's the officer's job. That's why they're constantly asking you questions. They are wanting you to incriminate yourself so they can write you a ticket at the very least, if not beat you up and throw you in jail. Now, here, this is another example of the police. Why do they continually think that they should not be photographed in public? that we do not have the right to film them. Meanwhile, everything that we, the people, do is under constant surveillance. Why do the police think that they do not have to be part of this constant global surveillance? Newsflash, guys, just because you're working for the globalists doesn't mean you're a part of their little clique. You're getting spied on just like the rest of us. And now, one of the largest cell phone companies in the world revealed the extent of just how pervasive government surveillance is worldwide. This was a brave move by them. Vodafone just wants their customers, they say, they want their customers to know they can trust them. Now, this detailed report provides the most comprehensive look to date at how governments are monitoring mobile phone communications. The most explosive revelation was that in six of the 29 countries that Vodafone services, authorities require immediate access to an operator's network, bypassing legal niceties like warrants. So basically in those countries, Vodafone doesn't even get any formal demand for lawful interception. The, the government agencies demand their own direct link into network equipment. Government agencies are able to listen to phone conversations live, and they can even track the location of citizens without warrants using secret cables, secret cables that are connected directly to the network equipment. Now, Vodafone released this law enforcement disclosure, disclosure report calling for an end to this warrantless wiretapping, the end of the direct access eavesdropping, and they want more transparency with how many warrants they are issuing and you know giving access to this private data. Well, now we're hearing the you know, NSA and its supporters are saying, oh, well, it's okay, you know, because we don't spy on you too much. We need a warrant to do that. But here is just further proof that that's a very vague blanket statement because those warrants can be issued to companies that request this data. They can be issued to local councils, the postal service, the ambulance services, banks. And we've reported that before on how fusion centers across the country are giving this data to just about anyone who needs access to it. They can say they need it because, um, you know, to detect pre-crime or if there's, you know, economic interests, economic well-beings, or obviously national security. So there's all kinds of reasons that companies can say that they need access to that data. It's not just